Welcome to Lecture 11 of BIB 102 New Testament Survey. The next three lectures are going to be focused upon the Book of Acts. In today's lecture, we're going to go through the introduction to the Book of Acts, the purpose and importance of the Book of Acts, the major divisions of the Book of Acts, and then we'll get into some of the content. So let's get started. Rub number one, the introduction to the Book of Acts. Letter A, this book was written by Luke. Now, obviously, this is the same individual, the Gospel of Luke. Many actually see this as one text that was written together. If you remember from the Gospel of Luke's notes, he was a physician. He was not one of the original 12 disciples, but was most likely a disciple, and then traveled with Paul on missionary journeys. Letter B. We believe this book was written sometime between A.D. 60 and A.D. 65, and it was written to a man named Theophilus. While we do not know exactly who this individual was, we do know that his name literally translates as friend of God or loving friend of God in the Greek. And then letter D, this book's key verse is Acts 1 verse 8. In Acts 1 verse 8 it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This sums up the entire portion, purpose, and content of the book of Acts. Now let's look at the purpose and importance of the book of Acts. Why was this book written? Well, firstly, letter A, this book presents a theological history of Christianity. It shows exactly how the gospel spread from Jerusalem all the way through the known world during the first century. Then letter B, it also gives us record of the spread of Christianity from Jerusalem to Rome. Luke actually picks up where he left off at the end of his gospel account and then continues to show the development of Christianity. And the reason why getting the gospel to Rome was so important is because an old expression that many people have heard before is that all, all roads lead to Rome. The fact that the gospel could get to Rome meant that from there it could spread out to the known world of that time. Letter C, this book shows the transition of the church. The gospel was first preached to the Jews. In fact, the early church was primarily a Jewish church. And then it gradually spread into the Gentile world until all of us were included. And then today, the church is primarily a Gentile church. Now let's look at letter D. This book furnishes principles for missionary work. Now, the spread of the gospel to other areas in the book of Acts was primarily done in groups. Some of the examples of that, you could see Peter and John in Acts 3, Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13, Barnabas and Mark in Acts 15, and Paul and Silas in Acts 16. Now, the only exceptions to that would be Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch and Peter to Cornelius. But I would like to point out that while this does furnish principles for missionary work, to them, they weren't considered or considering themselves missionaries. They honestly just considered that to be their Christian duty to spread the gospel to the world. Roman rule three, major divisions within the book of Acts. The book of Acts can be split into two major divisions. The first division is Acts 1 through 12. Some features of Acts 1 through 12 is number one, Jerusalem is the center of activity for the church. Not only is Jerusalem the center of activity for the church in the first division of the book of Acts, but number two, Peter is the central figure of the church in this section. He becomes more of the spokesperson for the church. We see him more prominently in Acts chapter 1 through 12 than any other of the disciples. And then lastly, number three, the Jewish homeland is evangelized. If you remember from our key verse, Jesus said he would give them power from the Holy Spirit to be ministers, evangelists, gospel givers to Jerusalem, Judea, and then the uttermost parts of the world. Peter and the disciples helped start in that Jerusalem Jewish area, and then it will be spread to this next division. And the second major division is Acts 13 through 28. Now, in contrast to Jerusalem being the center of activity of the church in the first division, Antioch is the center of the church activity in this last half. This is a very Gentile area, the, the place of Antioch. It would be around the area of modern-day Turkey today. 
Then number two, Paul is now the central figure of the church. Peter primarily focused with the Jews. Well, Paul, he felt that God had called him to specifically evangelize the Gentiles, which leads us to number three, the world is evangelized. This shows us that the disciples were very careful to make sure they fulfilled Jesus' wishes to start in Jerusalem, spread the gospel to Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to all parts of the earth. Now that we looked at the major divisions within the book of Acts, let's look at some major content in the book of Acts. Letter A. The first thing I want to point out is in Acts chapter 1 where Jesus ascends to heaven. Now while standing with the disciples on the Mount of Olives, Jesus instructs them that the Holy Spirit would come and baptize them. He then ascends into heaven and two angels tell the disciples that Jesus will return the same way he left. Luke also records that Jesus stayed on earth 40 days after his resurrection before he ascended to the Father. Letter B. The, the disciples replaced Judas with Matthias as one of the twelve. Now, after Jesus' ascension in the earlier parts of Acts chapter 1, Peter ends up preaching to the disciples about replacing Judas with someone who had accompanied them from Jesus' baptism to his resurrection. His reasoning was that Jesus had promised 12 thrones to the 12 disciples. Well, they obviously only had 11, so they needed to replace that one individual, Judas, who was no longer a part of them. They ended up casting lots, which was an Old Testament Jewish way of determining something with, like, dice. They were actually rocks with um, writings on them, and they cast these lots between two individuals. The first individual's name was Joseph Barsabbas Justus. And the second individual's name was Matthias. And we find from Acts chapter 1, the lots fell on Matthias, and he became the twelfth disciple. Let us see. The Holy Spirit descends from heaven, and the church begins on the day of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost was a Jewish festival, a Jewish sacrificial feast time that every male Jew was required to attend. Pentecost was 50, Penta, days after the Passover. Therefore, this was 50 days after Jesus' crucifixion and 10 days after his ascension. Now, while a great multitude of Jews were gathered together since they were required to come worship and sacrifice, the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, which that word in the Greek literally translates as languages. Some were amazed that they were able to hear the disciples speak in their own languages. So Peter defends their actions and says that it actually foreshadowed a prophecy of another future event where it will happen again. And then he preaches that Jesus was the fulfillment of Davidic prophecy to them and to all of us. And then how he died and arose from the dead. This message convicted the disciples, or excuse me, the Jews. This message convicted the Jews there, and they asked what they needed to do to be saved. Peter replied that they needed to repent, and then they would be baptized because their sins were forgiven, and they would receive the Holy Spirit. The Bible records here that about 3,000 people gladly received Peter's word and were baptized. Letter D. Peter heals a crippled beggar. Luke records that at around 3 p.m., Peter and John went into the temple and they saw a man who was born lame, begging for money at the gate called Beautiful. Peter tells the man that he did not have any money, but what he had was something much better, the ability to heal him. He was immediately healed, and this amazed the Jews. But Peter challenged them all to repent and be converted to have their sins blotted out because they killed the only just and righteous healer, Jesus Christ. Letter E, Ananias and Sapphira lie to the Holy Spirit. Now in Acts chapter four, it's recorded that the generosity of Christians during the first century was enormous. People would sell everything they had to be able to finance the ministry of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, in contrast to Barnabas and other people's generosity, Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, sold a possession, but they kept back some of the money. 
The keeping back part of the money wasn't the problem. The problem was when Ananias brought that part of the money and gave it to the disciples under the false pretense that that was all that they sold it for. So he lied. And Peter reprimands him for allowing Satan to, Satan to influence him and said he's not lied to them. He's lied to the Holy Spirit. He's lied to God. Immediately, Ananias died and he was taken out and buried. Well, three hours later, Sapphira came to the apostles as well. And Peter asked her if she and Ananias had really sold the land for as much as Ananias said. She agreed not knowing that her husband had already just died for lying. And Peter tells her that the same people that buried her husband are about to bury her, and she immediately drops dead as well. And the same individuals that buried her husband took her outside of the gates and buried her as well. Letter F. The proto-deacons are chosen to take care of Hellenistic widows. Now, we all have heard of what deacons are in many churches. Proto means first. These are the first deacons, the model deacons, where we get the idea of the office of a deacon today in church. Well, how did this come about? We find out in Acts chapter 6 that the number of disciples had greatly multiplied, greatly multiplied. And some Grecians were upset because the Hebrews were neglecting their widows, or at least they felt that they were neglecting their widows in the daily ministry. Instead of getting upset and defending themselves, the twelve got together to reason a solution, and they decided to let those Grecians pick out from amongst themselves seven men who were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom and had a great reputation. We find out that they choose seven Grecians, and one in particular was named Stephen. And letter G, Stephen becomes the first martyr for Christ. We find out here that a group of extremists captured Stephen, brought him to the Sanhedrin, and had false witnesses testify against him. Interestingly, the council noticed Stephen's great composure in the midst of the trial. They then asked Stephen for his side of the story. So, Stephen started with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and David and Solomon, and he summed up the entire Old Testament and then appealed to the prophets for the veracity of Jesus by rebuking them for not believing and crucifying him. Well, this infuriated the council, and they took him outside to stone him. But the Bible records Stephen looks up, sees Jesus, and prays that Jesus would not hold their actions against them. We find out after this, Stephen does die, and we're introduced to an individual who was there as an accomplice to the murder of Stephen, Saul of Tarsus. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 11 for BIB 102 New Testament Survey. The next two lectures, we will finish up the Book of Acts. Hope you enjoyed this lecture. If you have any questions or you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact me.